Hello and welcome to Mr. Speed's speech continued. <laughs> By this I mean it's Long Patrol part three of the Britain in the 1980s Long Patrol. And we're starting off by looking at the Royal Navy in the 1980s. What the debate going on about them was about and what they were considered to be for. And this is an interesting thing because they do understand there is a lot of clarity there about what the Royal Navy is for. It's one of those interesting things that's continued to this day, arguably. There is a lot of understanding about what the Navy's for. There's not a lot of willingness to pay for the necessary stuff for the Navy. It's not just the Navy, it's also the Army and the Air Force. In that you have a general idea that just having the capability, as in you have this capability, is all it needs. Not having the capability in enough quantity that you can do it when you need to do it. Because when you need to do it might not be when you want to do it, or when you're preparing for it. Or after you've had a nice time of exercising to make sure everyone's up to speed on it, then being able to not do anything for about a month or so, so engineering-wise everything can be checked out, made sure it's perfect in tip-top condition, and then you can go and do the operation, and it will not last any longer than necessary than your supplies will uh, require to support it. That's a nice idea. We'd all like it to be true. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? So, the Royal Navy strategic role in the 1980s, NATO. Let's start off with the question. Mr. Stanley Newens of Harlow. The minister has set out a considerable list of so-called improvements that he would like to see. Defence expenditure is already completely out of accord with the expected rate of economic growth. Will those improvements be made within the present defence budget? If the government decide in favour of Trident, will that not lead to considerable reductions in the standard of living? I'm always going to have someone suggest the standard of living costs. Mr. Speed, the answer to the first question is yes. The improvements I have already uh, have already been costed and come within the budget. Unless we can enjoy the life in freedom and under the protection of law, the Honourable Gentleman's constituents will find that is hardly worth living. As the Honourable of Adagliff said, the growing number of Soviet aircraft, particularly the backfire bomber, that can now be deployed into the Atlantic, armed with improved air-to-surface missiles, are a major threat to the NATO surface fleet. We believe that to counter that threat, effectively, layers of air defence are necessary to protect our ASW task groups. They comprise air defence fighters, medium range, area defence missiles, short range point defence missiles, and electronic warfare techniques. The Sea Harrier operating from Hermes in the first instance, and from the anti submarine carriers as they come into service, will provide the Royal Navy with the first of those layers. Initial deliveries of this aircraft have been made, and the first frontline squadron was commissioned at Yeovilton last March. The Sea Dart medium range missile system provides a second layer, and this is being deployed to the sea in the Type 42 destroyers, six of which are now in service with a further eight on order, and on the anti submarine carriers. So, in other words, they are planning for 18 ships to be having them. Three Invincibles, HMS Bristol, the lone Type 82, and the 14 Type 42 destroyers planned. Okay. Should guarantee at least six available at any one point. We plan to make improvements to the system to maintain its effectiveness to the end of the century. The third layer is provided by the Seawolf Point Defense Missile System which is entering service with the Type 22 ASW frigates and some of the Leander-class frigates when they refit. In view of the threat and the capability of this missile system, we shall be considering a much wider fit, including the Invincible class. That would have been cute. Finally, electronic warfare is playing an increasing role in the fleet and the substantial improvements are planned for ships, submarines and aircraft. We believe that these will prove to be a most cost-effective means of countering both air-to-surface and surface-to-surface -surface missiles. 
Among the improvements planned are electronic support measures such as Abbey Hill, designed to provide early warning of hostile radar emissions. Electronic countermeasures, uh, including new radar jammers and decoy systems designed to confuse anti-ship missiles. In the latter stages of their approach, these will enter service on some vessels later this year. One of the most dramatic aspects of the growing Soviet naval threat has been the expansion of the surface fleet. And further improvements are expected during the 1980s with the introduction of new class of ships and weapons that will increase its size, range and striking power. I confirm that the Honourable Gentleman said about that. Our response and the, the, is the anti-ship guided uh, missile weapon launched from submarines, surface ships, aircraft and helicopters. Our hunters killer submarines will be armed with sub-harpoon. The first to carry it will be HMS Courageous in 1982. Exit will be fitted to more Leander class frigates. The Sea Skewer surface to air missile will uh, enter service next year and will be carried by Lynx helicopters, while the Sea Harrier and RAF Buccaneers and Tornadoes will carry Sea Eagle, a supersonic sea skimming anti ship missile due to enter service in the mid 1980s. A fourth major threat to our ships and the submarines in wartime would come from naval mines. The Soviet Union has large stocks of these weapons, which can be laid from submarine ships or aircraft, and the continental shelf around Northwest Europe is particularly vulnerable. To counter that threat, we plan to introduce new mine countermeasure vessels, and the first of the Hunt class MCMVs has already entered service. I'm pleased to take this appropriate opportunity to inform the House that under uh, that an order has been placed today with Vosper Fornicroft, UK LTD. To build four further mine countermeasures vessels of the Hunt class. The first of that new class of vessels, Adrian's Brecken, entered service six months ago in December 1979. The second, Adrian's Ledbury, was also launched in December. The vessels have Paxman diesel engines and glass reinforced plastic hulls, with a low magnetic signature, and have both a mine hunting and sweeping capability. They will play an important part, role in safeguarding the waters of Northwest Europe, which are particularly vulnerable to Soviet naval mines. They and their successor ships will remain the gold standard of nine MCMVs in NATO forces for the next 40 plus years. Ah, well. <clears throat> it's fun. The interesting thing is, where would you put Seawolf on the Invincible class? Where would you put Seawolf on the Invincible class? After all, there are only so many positions on those sides of carrots. If they've been, I don't know, about an extra 5 to 10,000 tons, and there mean 4 or 5 of them built as. The Honourable Member for Aftercliffe and Sheffield, as uh, Sheffield Aftercliffe had said, I... Well, there might well have been space found. Invincible class that launched having Phalanx, Seawolf, and Sea Dart. That would have been a fairly decent vessel. Oh, next slide. The current order announced today is worth just over 100 million and will bring the total number of MCMVs in service or on order to nine, two of which are being built by Yarrow and the rest by Vosper. Four latest vessels will be called Atrans Brogsby, Dalton, Chiddingford, and Hubwell. For a leading review of our plans for new equipment, I should like to consider the next generation of warships. The cost of building modern warships is escalating rapidly. We are not alone in finding facing the, that problem, which is common to all maritime members of the Alliance. There is no evidence that other countries are able to build ships of comparable quality more cheaply. The complexity and therefore the cost of our ships is a direct response to the increasing sophistication of the threat. However, while we cannot allow ourselves to be outmatched by the equipment ranged against us, we will have to consider carefully the balance in our fleet between high quality and high cost vessels and less sophisticated and cheaper ships. We are looking at the possibility of much simpler ships, perhaps based on merchant ship hulls, as a means of carrying more anti-submarine warfare helicopters to sea. 
Secondly, we're considering whether the successor to Type 23 frigates, two, twi two frigates, could be a simpler, smaller, cheaper vessel, while retaining sufficient capability to make a proper contribution to anti-submarine warfare operations in the Atlantic. There will be pressures on us in both directions. On the one hand, the threat will ensure that the capabilities that we need will not be available cheaply. On the other, there will be pressure on us to stretch our limited resources as far as possible, and to economise in the use of manpower. It will not be easy to get the balance right, but we shall have to try. There is no prospect of more holes in the water unless we solve the problem, and that work is proceeding with urgency. At present, some 24,000 people are directly employed on Royal Navy contracts, the vast majority of those being in development areas. Many more are employed in associated industries as a result of Royal Navy contracts. The Naval Programme provides work for three specialist warship builders, Vickers at Barrow, Bosper at Southampton, and Yarrow at the Clyde, as well as needing the capacity of other warship builders. The Royal Navy has a major program of surface warships and submarines under construction. The Honourable Member for Adcliffe had his fun in the fence debate and again today about ordering ships. I do not begrudge him that. However, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Tymouth, Mr. Tropper, is right. I am bound to remind the House that the timing of the two destroyers and two frigates ordered by the Honourable Gentleman's Government last year was interesting. Having nothing and done nothing for a long time, and with, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, a distinctive outflow of skilled manpower, Labour government were defeated in Parliament on the 27th of March 17, 1979, and a general election was announced. Surprise, surprise! Four orders totally, totaling nearly 400 million were announced on 25th of April, just in time for the last edition of the weekly papers before the general election on the 3rd of May. And it's fair enough. I'm grateful for the fact that ships were ordered. But that was done just prior to the election. They'll be delivered in due course. Since then, we placed an order in September last year at Scott Levco for a unique seabed operation of the vessel to be called HMS Challenger, which is designed to replace the aging diving tender HMS Reclaim and provide a seagoing platform for the development uh, develop, uh, for the uh, developed naval saturation diving system. It'll be equipped to find and inspect objects on the seabed and, where appropriate, recover them. That sophisticated ship will be a one-off, and is expected to make a very valuable contribution to the successful development of man's ability to work on a seabed at great depths. When I visited the International Naval Technology Exhibition at Rotterdam earlier this year month, the ship was the subject of a great deal of international interest. Last July, an order for a Trafalgar class SSN was placed with Vickers, and a number of smaller vessels have been ordered from various shipyards. As announced on 5th of March, contract negotiations on offshore patrol vessels have proceeded, and we hope to place an order with uh, Hall R Russell of Aberdeen for two very shortly. I've just announced the order of four MCMVs from Vossilva. Before leaving the fleet, there is, of course, the vital question of fleet support, particularly as far as the five dockyards are concerned. I know a number of honourable members would wish to raise the problems of dockyards in this debate, and I hope with the House permission to deal with those in a more detail in my winding up speech. There was fun when politics gets involved, but again, he's not wrong. No, Mr. Duffy is not wrong. It's a well known tactic of governments, they place defense orders. It's why there's a lot of talk for about four years, and then the orders tend to be placed in the final year. If we consider the recent saga of the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, where we ordered to and paid the constructive costs of about three and a bit in order to delay their interest service, uh, service entry date and there was governments considering whether to success of governments considering whether to cancel them or to keep them or whatever and then finally the contract had been written up so neatly that they couldn't it was going to be dramatically expensive It always is. Interesting. You've just been talking about the starting of 
the Type 23 program that comes after Type 22. The idea of a cheaper frigate. Um, Anti-submarine warfare general purpose frigate. Nowadays, of course, the Type 26 isn't replacing the Type 22. In fact, the Type 22 is gone from a service long ago. Type 26 is to replace the Type 23 anti-submarine warfare submarine uh, frigates. Some of the best considered in NATO still. And we're getting the cheaper Type 31 frigate to replace the general purpose Type 23s. Which there are still rumours abounding because after governments announced that it was going to be you know, investing in defence and growing defence, they're expected, it's still expecting those to be covers for cuts. Uh, I hope not. Because honestly, there really isn't anything left to be cut. If you cut it, you're basically going, yeah, we're talking a big game, but we are not going to be doing anything. What'll be interesting is to see what happens after the Type 31, after the Type 26. More replace the Type 45. Will there be a Type 32? What will the Type 32 be? That's, that's all interesting topics. Um, again, the Type 31, Type 23, they are all symptoms, that, even the Leander class, are all symptoms of this need, this looking for getting hull numbers up. Getting a practical useful vessel into the service that can provide the presence around the world for long-range deployments and can provide in wartime the ships which will flesh out task groups. Because yes, you need the Type 26s and the Type 45s. You need those elite air defense and anti-submarine warfare vessels, those vessels which are very focused and dedicated on their missions. But the truth is you can't afford to have a fleet which is made up entirely of them. Look at the US Navy. They've been trying for years to make up a fleet entirely of Arleigh Burks. Now they're building Constellation class frigates after all sorts of under the LCS. You need to have a high-low mix. That's what your task groups are. In World War II, you had some destroyers and some cruisers which were high level and some which were lower. Let's be honest, as much as I love the Arafusa class, if you're putting one next to a town class cruiser, you're not exactly going to go, yes, that Arafusa. First rate, top of the line. You know, look at the town class cruiser and go. Okay, so there is a there is a a standard there is a sort of difference here. A refuser uh, having hull numbers, town class having something very very powerful to kick butt. Excuse the French. High-low mix is natural. The problem becomes when you have navies that are told you can only have so many hulls, that we won't be funding this, that we won't properly invest in this. So navies end up going, right then, what the cost of what it takes longer to build, the high end or the low end? The high end. So you're focusing on the high end, and you keep having to build the high end, and the high end gets more and more expensive because the high end always gets more expensive. But also, the reason the high end gets more expensive is because you're not building the low end. Here's the dirty little secret about how you keep high end ships cost effective, or at least less costly. You keep those yards constantly building. How do you keep the yards constantly building? When you're not building a high end ship, you give them a low end ship to build, and you just keep those chugging along. So, yes, Type 31s, Type 32s. It looks like Britain's going to be doing a two, uh, uh, a two factory system. 
with one fa uh, one shipyard producing the low end units or medium end units and one shipyard producing the high end. And I hope that does work. I hope that's what they go with. One doing Type 26 and then Type 45 successor. One doing Type 31, Type 32, Type 33, Type 34. I don't give a flying hoop, really. What they are, or how great or how their capabilities are. As long as their capabilities are effective, they're probably off the shelf. You buy them, you churn them out. And instead of holding on to them for decades, you either stick them in reserve if you don't, if you have more ships than you need, or you sell them and you continue building new ones. And this has a big impact on the whole layers of the system. Why? Right then, so I'm saying two yards, but surely the low end building built in one yard and the high end building built in another yard doesn't have an impact. Well, they're keeping three yards going in the 1980s, and what does that have an impact on? Well, that means the engine, uh, the engine manufacturer, which is a big area of expense, has a constant throughput of engines. So they don't have to start charging on engine construction, uh, don't have to start charging a premium on them to cover them, for, to maintain their workforce and maintain their skills during the famines because it's a glut and famine approach. So that means that when you're in a glut, you have to charge more to see you through the famine. If you keep a constant flow of work coming through, it means that, well, for starters, if I put my prices up and I'm your supplier, then there's a constant flow of work going. Another supplier is gonna step up and try and undercut me. So I have to be offering this at a reasonable cost. I, I can't start charging them because suddenly it becomes a viable business plan for other businesses to get involved because there is this constant. So that means I have to be more economically efficient. So, and it goes on for all the systems, uh, VLS manufacture, combat information systems, Training, everything. If you can keep a constant flow of ships, a constant flow of work, and you can make things a constant, a consistent, not constant, but a consistent level, things get cheaper. It's logic, though. And history. In the debate on the defense estimates, I reminded the House on the high priority that the government attached to getting the right kind of men and women for the armed forces. And the problem that we faced when we came into office, the Navy has special problems. Even in the span of my experience, there have been tremendous changes in the sorts of men needed to by the fleet. Today's warships with complex propulsion units and weapon systems will count for nothing if we cannot recruit enough men and women of the right educational standards and attitudes of mind. We must recruit, train, and retain them. We seem to be succeeding. Recruiting is going well. In 1979 to 80, we recruited the highest number of ratings for several years, 30% more than in 1987, uh, 78 to 79. We also recruited almost 20% more officers than in previous year. However, recruiting is only part of the story. The key to a fully manned and fully trained fleet is retention. On the whole, retention is more important head for head because it means that we keep men and women who are trained and experienced and by definition content with their lot. It also means a great saving in overall costs, and it takes the strain off the Navy's heavily burdened training machine. As for recruiting, the evidence from retention is that, the, is that this government's policy is succeeding. Notice given by rating in 1979 to 80 was 25% down on the previous year. And the number of men who have withdrawn, uh, have withdrawn notice has doubled. The number of officers applying for premature retirement has reduced by some 40% over the previous year, and is now almost down to the traditional level. However, despite these trends, I cannot report to the House that our manpower picture is yet satisfactory. We're still suffering from the effects of the heavy notice giving of the over a year ago because of the 18-month time lag for the notice period. 
The train strength of men in the Royal Navy actually dropped in the last year. We expect a graph to bottom out this autumn, and thereafter we hope they will move slowly upwards. However, we are significantly short on Navy's total trained requirement for men. Moreover, overall figures conceal shortages in key areas. We are seriously short of junior seamen of officers and junior engineer officers, and short of nearly 1,000 artificers, about 12% of our requirement for that group. We are going on the, prob the problem, and with sound trends in both recruitment and retention, we can feel more cautious optimism. However, it will take a lot of hard work before I can hope to report a more satisfactory position. Moreover, we are approaching the demographic trough. The number of 16 to 19 year olds from whom we recruit so extensively will diminish from mid 1980s. We must therefore expect a continuous struggle to ensure that we get the numbers and quality of men needed in the fleet for the fleet. Another important option is greater commit employment of women. The Wrens already make up a valuable contribution to the naval service, and their recruiting and quality are excellent. The average length of the service of Wren officers equates to that of short service male officers. For Wren's ratings, it is improving and is now a little over half that of the men. Obviously, there are difficulties about employing women in the Navy because of constraints on combat and sea service, which limit their employment with the fleet. However, the Navy is increasing in its specialization on the Wren's officers and broadening the scope of Wren's ratings in technical fields. For example, the first air mechanics are now on the courses. Many other options are being looked at, including operation duties short of combat, and we hope to see an expansion for the roles of women. In the Queen Alexandra's Royal, Na Na Royal Navy Nurse Nursing Service, our main task has been the, a rather novel one of ensuring that there are fair opportunities for male nurses. We have agreed in principle to an establishment of an integrated naval ner nursing service with the Q Queen's, uh, Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service, and that should quickly improve the men's career opportunities. In the defence debate, I spoke extensively about pay and conditions of service, and the House knows that we have continued to honour our commitments to restore and maintain full comparability of service pay. For the Royal Navy, we have also provided worthwhile movements of to the improvements to the compensation paid for those who have endured particularly arduous conditions and improvements in the and uh, separation allowances. Rail cards have been greatly welcomed by the Navy, which suffers particularly from family separation. All good. And it always is retention it comes down to. One of the interesting things I've heard recently about the Type 23s and the idea that we might be losing some, but hopefully we won't, I said hopefully the government won't be that silly, is that the reason is because of a shortage of senior trained NCOs. Well, we got rid of second class warrant officer in the UK a few years ago. Well, about a year or so ago, probably. And so I think, not sure if all have been phased out to W01s, but. Here's an idea. A, get rid of the have to retire, uh, retire level at any age well, for your senior NCOs. As long as they pass fitness, they can stay. Push it up to 60. Push it higher if you want to. So they don't have to get out if they don't want to. Honestly, if they're, they're healthier, they're work, if they're healthy enough, they're passing the fitness tests. It's not age of sale. The chief is not, uh, the chief uh, petty officers and the uh, warrant officers, they're not there because you want them to be super strong, hifting and hauling ropes and all that stuff. They're, they're there because you need their leadership skills. They're, problem-solving abilities, their minds. Do that. Secondly, and this is slightly more contentious, if you have some really good leading seamen, Killix, and others of more junior NCO ranks, put them in accelerated course and make them WO2s. Bring it back. Have WO2 be the position which 
you can jump up people to who are below the age group normally for a warrant officer, but who show ex exemplary promise. And yes, that does create problems down the line because you lose some of your good leading seamen, etc., because of leading sailors, whatever they're going to call it, when they probably rename it something. Um, and it, you then need to prop your sailors up. It goes down. And it's not a fix all, but main t doing those two things. One, re reinstating WO2 as a, posi as a position that you can accelerate excellent candidates to. And allowing WO1s to serve until they feel they don't want to serve any longer. Doesn't seem an absurd idea. And should help with attention. Right, I'm going to finish this part here. Mainly because it's got to half an hour long, it's only halfway through, and I'm trying to not make these hour long. So, seems there's going to be a part 2A and a part 2B. Well, no, a part 3A and a part 3B. Ah, oh, well, life happens. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll be explaining the rest to you and going for the rest of the speech in part 3B. Thank you. Take care.